Test, test, test. Hello, everybody. Today we solve hard interactive problems. There is this list of three problems that I chose. We will go with those exactly in this order. It's not a very easy stream. The problems are not easy. But also tomorrow I'm going for my main channel to make a shorter video on some easier problems where usually we just use binary search almost every time. When you see an interactive problem, you should, well, at least think about binary search. You should at least consider it. Uh, today it will be not that easy. First problem, mostly A. There is a string and almost all characters are A. We need to find this string by comparing with it with other chosen strings. The idea is that only very few characters are not A. Almost everything is A. What can we do? Well, I will first tell you what is not very efficient because it doesn't use that much the property of so many characters A. For every character, we can binary search it. This is quite standard. And as I said, it doesn't use the, the special property. What does it mean to binary search a character? Uh, we know what is the length of a string. And we can figure out what's the first character. How do we do it? We can try various characters here, like A, B, and so on, up to Z, and always just fill the suffix with, I don't know, characters A, maybe you want characters Z instead. Uh, but with this query, is the hidden string lexicographically smaller or greater than, for example, this one, you will basically get information whether the first character is smaller than D or not. So you can binary search every character separately. And that's the, the number of queries needed is then N times log of alphabet size log of 26. And this is clearly too slow because each time we need to print or ask to, to a function uh, some string of length 50,000. This is bad. Of course, after you after you know the first character, let's say you already know that the first character is E, the next one is F, then here you binary search this guy from A to Z. You ask first maybe about K, again, fill with A's, ask about this, information, the response will tell you whether character here is smaller than K or not. For each position, you have log of alphabet size queries times the number of positions. Okay, that's bad. We don't want that. Uh, but we know that almost all characters are A. So maybe I should use that in my binary search to speed it up. Whenever I want to figure out the next position, I can first ask about, let's say, B with characters A. And this way I will get information whether this on this position we have A or not. And almost always this will be true. Instead of log of 26, almost always I will have just one query. If you, uh, instead of standard binary search, you first ask to figure out in one query whether there is character A on the next position you have n times 1, or maybe n minus k times 1. That many times it's enough to just ask a single query, plus k times you need to actually binary search, log of 26. Still, this first term, this boils down to just often. This first term is too big. You cannot uh, do it in often. Chat. Do you have some ideas? I will especially appreciate ideas from people who didn't know about the problem before. How to avoid binary searching every next position? Or maybe let's think about it differently. What is the case when we are very not efficient? Or what really, how the string looks like? It has a bunch of characters A in a row. A hidden string might be like this. A, 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 C, A, 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 X. A, 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 and actually thousands of A's. Randomization. 
maybe, maybe, but binary search is rarely worse than randomization. When you ask queries and you get information low or high in some way, then the randomization is just worse way of binary search. Binary search on the number of A's in a row, exactly. We want to, but let's understand why. It is almost always what happens is that so many A's in a row there are here like thousands and thousands on average and divided by k so many of them and we want to figure them out uh, we want to handle them very quickly not one by one and over to characters or not yeah we binary search i will write this down and now let's go full screen um, binary search the number of a's in a row or equivalently, you can say binary search position of first non A. Just because we, the, our goal should be to s quickly skip this huge interval of A's to eventually find, let's say, a C, something different than A. And that's the solution. How do we, we implement that? I always like to think about hidden sequences or hidden strings as a series of underscores. I want to know if all of this is A. How do I check that? I fill that with A. And uh, maybe the last character I change to B, then everything here to A. And I ask if the hidden string is smaller than that. If so, it means the whole prefix is filled with A. So this is my query. This is my query. Query. And this way I will know if this prefix is full of A. If so, in my binary search I go more to, more to the right. So I know that this is all A's and somewhere here the interval of A's ends. So binary search gets to this interval. If actually it, it turns out that the hidden string is greater lexicographically than this, then I know that interval of A's ends somewhere here. That's it. Every next, every next non-A or every interval of A's we handle in log of n. Because we binary search pessimistically from 0 to n, the position. And how many times do we do that? How many non-A's do we have in a string? K. So total queries is uh, k times log of n. You repeatedly run binary search to find position of first non-A, or equivalently, how many A's in a row we have. Uh, then also, once you find the position, uh, you need to this. You need to find what actually character is there. So we will figure out, oh, there are five A's. Then on position six, there is non-A. I can binary search it actually in log of 25 because only 25 characters are available there. And uh, so the, in total we have k times log of n plus log of alphabet size. And closing a bracket, right? No. Yes, <laughs> this, this one. This is a hard interactive problem. Certainly it's not easy. It's important that here we don't multiply, because it's not that one binary search is nested in another binary search. We ask log of n queries of this type, and then once we figure out on which position there is this first non-A, we binary search here from B to Z. So first log of n, then log of 25. Oh, also, it's not that the problems today are extremely difficult. As I said in code forces, uh, I think it's like division one B. I would say this one. Questions about this one? Constructing string no often. Yes, it is often. That's the number of queries, and that was uh, what we cared about. Like 
every query yeah you ask in o of n so total time complexity is o of n times the number of queries and times the one log plus the other log this is the time complexity which is fine n is 50,000 and everything else here is very small I use one node What video is best to start? Watch my how to start with competitive programming. No. There is a bonus here. A hard version, minimize the number of queries. What we did was fine. It fits in time limit, but there also could be a harder version of this problem where they say, just get the best possible solution, which means minimize the number of queries in the worst case of course in case of binary search in increasing sequence the best algorithm is of course to exactly ask in the middle then go to both halves and so on and you will get exactly a ceiling of log of n queries how do we minimize the number of queries here this is actually a combinatorics or dp problem uh, the thing is that we want to with our binary search always split up uh, the set of possibilities into two equally sized sets. So how to solve, how to really minimize the number of queries. It doesn't mean decrease the number of queries, minimize, so minimum possible. We want the optimal solution. For this, we need to always ask about string exactly in the middle of a set of possible strings. And this is a counting problem. If, if we figure out a way, we need a function to count the number of possible strings. And also, if when we ask about something, the number of strings is smaller than that. Let's see an example. Let's say that n is 2, k is equal to 1. Uh, the available strings are aa, a, B, A, C, A, D, and so on, A, Z, then B, A, B, C, A, and so on, C, Z. There are what, 20, 25 plus 25, 51 of them. Then I believe this is the middle one. Need to ask this. Of course, uh, wait, 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 Z, A. So for this, you need to figure out exactly string in the middle. And that's possible with some kind of DP where or combinatorics slash counting, where always when you construct a string from left to right, you need a way to figure out what's the number of ways to finish this string. So what's the number of possible suffixes? The number of strings in total isn't that huge of a number. You long long is not enough but it's not that it will be 10 to 1000th power. OK, is small. Any so values we use, we use values up to n to 10th power or so, maybe actually even smaller than that, maybe not. So small big nums are enough. So you need to use big nums and you need to use some dp slash counting in order to create a string from left to right and, all, and basically answer a query, what's the middle string out of available ones? So what's the k smallest, where k is the number of all strings divided by two. This is how you would solve this harder version. That was everything about problem one, mostly A. Now we move to Cloister, which was problem uh, invented by Radeusz and MNBVMAR. It was, it was from their, uh, their IC, ICPC contest. All the problems in that contest, to, to change this, all the problems in this contest were about Pokemon, and it's one of those. I would say the statement is about mountain, mountains. Uh, let's see what's the statement. This is the simplified version. If you want to read the full one with the story, it's here. All right. 
Loister. There is a grid with some very special property. Uh, for every cell, let's say that there is five here, it's guaranteed that one of eight neighboring cells is greater than this, is greater than five. So one of those neighbors is six or greater, at least one of them. In other words, there is no local maximum. There is no peak in this drawing. There is, of course, one exception, the global maximum. There is one value that is like bigger than everything else in the grid. And that's the cell you need to find. How do we go about it? The number of queries allowed is linear of n. So it seems there is no logarithm in the time complexity. It Likely, it's not binary search. Uh, if you ask about all the cells, it's n squared, and that's more than 3n. Uh, Yashen stops spamming. It's not related to the stream. One idea I remember I had when trying to solve this problem for the first time. OK, you, you get a timeout for now. I remember that I had the idea to try random cells, choose the biggest value out of those, and then always check neighbors and go to maximum. This was incorrect idea. Incorrect idea. Try, let's say, I don't know, n, n plus 100 random cells. Find max out of them then keep going greedily start from there keep going greedily that was my idea it doesn't work what's the intuition how good should be well, there is i think the worst case for this is one huge snake or some, some big shape for this grid that i will draw it Let's say that there is an increasing path looking maybe like this. Through all the, through actually half the cells. The, the first column is taken, the third column is taken, and there are values zero in between. Like maybe this is value one, two, three, four, those are zeros, and so on. This is the maximum. For this cell, around for this test, around half the cells create this huge snake. If you ask, and the snake is of size n squared, if you ask around n queries, on average you will get the distance from the maximum will be n. So this n from maximum from the end. Uh, like if, for example. If you ask, if 10 times you get a random value from 1 to 100, on average your maximum will be around 90. So on average case, you will get indeed something like 2n. Of course, there is some constant factor here. Those are estimations only, maybe 3 times n. But from time to time, you will exceed it. Like there is maybe 10% that actually your distance will be twice n. So for sure, if there are more than 100 tests, there will be one where you will fail. So this idea is not is not good enough. To just try random cells, choose the best one of them, so maybe closest to the maximum, and keep going greedily. Also, there is this thing where when you keep going greedily, always you need to f ask about eight neighbors. And uh, that means the number of queries gets multiplied by eight. And that's bad. So from those estimations from next slide, it seems that we will need maybe first around n random queries and then 8 times n if your distance to the maximum is n. That's pretty bad. Too much. Okay. Now let's talk about something better. Or actually, I will assume that 
n times log is OK. Because we often use binary search in interactive problems, so let's try to use binary search. This is not OK. We are allowed only 3 times n. But let's say n times log is, is allowed. Let's say we're solving subtask or just we're coming up with a worse solution. That's a good start. It's better than nothing. And what's that? There is a way to binary search on any kind of grid if you are able to split it in half. How do we split it in half? Well, certainly not by asking about the middle value. If you ask about this value you will say, and you will get info 5, you can even ask about neighbors and maybe out of them the maximum is here 8 and other are smaller than 5 or maybe there is another maximum here 7. Still you have no idea where the maximum is. It's not guaranteed. The maximum can be here. For example, maybe from 5 you get here to 8, but maybe maximum actually is somewhere here. It, it can happen. 8 still can have a bigger value somewhere here, and there can be this long path to a 1000. Why not? It's a bad idea to just ask about the middle guy. But in order to really split the grid in half, I will do exactly that. I will ask about one column. Let's ask about the column and say that there are values here 7, 5, 12, 1, 3, 4. What do we do with that? 12 is the maximum, so it seems important in some way. Uh, so what? I can, I'm going to ask about neighbors of 12. Of course, it can happen that all of them are smaller than 12. Then I would say 12 is the answer. Great, I got lucky. But more likely, one of them will be greater. I'm worried about a situation like this one. Let's say there is 15 here. And then 8, 9, there is 16 here, 11 and 7. In this situation, we don't know whether we should go left or right. You might say we go left because 16 is greater than 50. But actually, this situation is impossible. And there is a reason for that. If there is this column with values only 12 or smaller, then this 15 cannot ever cross this column. The statement basically said, from every cell, you can keep going to a greater neighbor and you will eventually get to the maximum. That's a very important observation or interpretation. For every cell, it's possible to get to the maximum with increasing path. So if maximum is somewhere here, from 15 you should be able to travel and get there. But you cannot cross this column because this column only has values 12 or smaller. Similarly, if the maximum is here, 16 couldn't get there. Which means that this situation is impossible. And instead, we know that value greater than 12 can only be on one side from this column. Maybe on the left from 12 there is here another 9. There is here uh, something greater than 12. And then I say, go to the right. In this case, we go here. Maybe there was a tie. Maybe this was another 15. I don't care. Uh, I still go here because I know the maximum must be here. If maximum was somewhere here, that's impossible because 15 couldn't get there. It couldn't cross the column. I repeat the solution. Ask about the middle column. I mean, ask about all the val n values there. Find the maximum. For the maximum, ask about six other neighbors on both sides, the blue in the drawing. And all, it's guaranteed that only on one side there will be something greater than 12. Go to that side. If, no, no, if uh, neither of the sides is greater than 12, it means that 12 is the maximum. And by 12 we mean, of course, the maximum in this column. If everything blue is smaller than maximum, it, we return coordinates of 12. There is some, let's say, implementation detail here. Uh, where when you implement, I think it's very easy to get wrong answer here with some detail. 
Uh, what's that? Oh, and still, we need to talk about the time complexity. Because always when you get to smaller by half, and you again ask about the column, it is of size n, you will get n times log n uh, queries. Also for each iteration, you will have six extra queries about blue guys. So it's more like n times log n to ask about columns, plus for each of those iterations, plus six for blue. Uh, but this is pretty bad. First, the time complexity. If you already implemented some divide and conquer in grids, you should know what's the fix. Divide and conquer in grids isn't always vertically. You need to go vertically and then horizontally and then vertically and so on. This is a general thing, not just about interactive problems. Divide and Concur on grids is done vertically, then horizontally, vertically, and so on. Remember that if you ever try to apply it, for example, to answer some kind of queries about, about rectangle. It means that you first split like this, and then let's say we go here to the right half, we split horizontally. We go here, maybe split vertically, split like that, and so on. And this is faster. Why is it faster? Previously, the time complexity was uh, the height of the grid, so just n. But let's say that the grid is h by w. Uh, previously, we had the number of queries h plus h plus h plus, and so on, being h times log of w. That was, was what I planned first. If I then this smaller half, I mean small, the, the, left, the right half, I again split vertically into two. And then one of the halves again vertically. It would be like that. So we had mm, we've splitting vertically. Now we have this line is h, then w divided by 2, h divided by 2 w divided by 4, h divided by 4, and so on. And this sums up to linear. I will uh, write that down in the drawing as well. This thing is just height of everything, but this is half. Maybe it's good to write it this way. This is full, this is half, this is half, this is one quarter. This is one quarter. Every next horizontal split is twice smaller. Right? Now, if you look at every second term, because it gets twice smaller and twice smaller, it sums up to 2h. And then when you look at every second term, you, it sums up to w. It's, it's almost 2h plus 2w. It's 2h plus w. But of course, it's a detail. doesn't matter. Oh, actually, it does matter if you see whether it passes the exact constraints from the statement. Uh, which means for our grid, n by n, what we got here is exactly 3 times n. And still, not only we have those, so we ask about this column, but also after finding the maximum here, we ask about the six neighbors let's say this was the maximum, then we ask about six blue neighbors. This is repeated logarithmically many times. Actually, the number of here repetitions is log of n, uh, log of h plus w. This is how many times you will have something. In this case, it's just 2n. And of course, log of 2n and log of n is the same in time complexity wise. We just estimate it like that. This shouldn't exceed 3n plus what? Uh, log of n. n was 2000, so that's 11. Uh, I will say 8. Shouldn't exceed that. In the statement, we had this uh, 210. I guess not to reveal the exact constraint. You could do twice minimum plus the maximum. Sure, but we have a square. We have a square. The statement said 120. 
What are you talking about? Two ten. Uh, no, the time complexity is fine. Uh, one last thing I said is something you would likely realize after implementing and getting wrong answer. Uh, what the, of course, when we get to a very small part, we can then brute force it. That that's not an issue. But here's an issue. When you go, uh, there is a big grid. When you keep going recursively you might not hit a meaningful maximum. What's that about? We ask about this column and the maximum, let's say 12, was here. And among neighbors, the greatest neighbor was here 14. So we go to the to the right half, right? We go here. You can include the column if you want, doesn't matter much. Then we ask about this column and the thing is, maximum here might be small, might be, as I said, not meaningful. Let's say there is here 8, and out of the blue here values, out of blue values, maybe maximum is at the bottom. Let's say that this is 11. 11 is hard to get actually, but let's say 9. This is possible. If we know if we know everything I now shown to you, we should understand that maximum is at the top, not at the bottom. How can this happen? Well, the increasing path from 9 to the top side, it indeed cannot cross this part because maximum here is 8, but it can cross that. Or even maybe it can go like this because we know about this part that it doesn't exceed 12 and nothing more we know. Maybe here everything is 7 or smaller, we cannot cross, but maybe from 8 and or maybe from 9 there is this increasing path to 14 or and then to maybe some maximum here, this is 50. It's a bit surprising that there is such an issue, that I'm sure you thought you believed me that the solution is fine but actually there's this so i will uh, say what's the fix when you go recursively to one of the halves like we went here and uh, we already knew that 14 is the maximum keep the maximum so far so the solution should actually be uh, go to some rectangle of course, the rectangle should be described as, I don't know, row low, row high, call low, call high, something like that, and coordinates of the maximum. Max and max, uh, row of this maximum. Mm, let's say max, no, value and its coordinates. Now what we do is the following. We ask about uh, this this row. We find the maximum here. We then ask about six neighbors of the maximum, but we actually consider seven values, not six. So there are those six candidates and also the maximum so far, the one from here. So you need to choose maximum out of seven blue cells, the six neighbors of maximum from the column or here arrow, the middle row and the seventh value is the one passed to you recursively from the higher function, from the previous call. And then it works. This, by the way, shows that we didn't fully understand the problem previously. I also didn't realize this at first. I recommend that you find the tutorial of this problem, which I'm sure should exist. Yeah, if you so in my blog with the list of problems for today, there is a link to problem cloister, and there is here on the right a link to tutorial, and there is indeed tutorial. Here you go. Implementation will not be easy, in particular because we alternately uh, split vertically and horizontally. There are tricks for that, like imagining 
mirroring or rotating the grid, uh, just swapping X and Y, but I agree the implementation is not that trivial. I agree that two functions would be bad. I would for sure handle the split with a for loop or an if with something smart. You don't want to implement two functions that will be basically the same. That was problem two, cloister. Now what's left is a problem three, moving car. Problem three, moving car. As Dalek said, it's almost a problem from NERC, North, Eastern, something, something, regionals. Uh, there is here PDF and you will find the problem. It's indeed very similar. There is asking about interval there, but it's not that important. Uh, and they immediately use the higher constraints, th those ones, up to 100,000. But I think up to 1,000 is already a nice problem. All right. Moving car. Something is at, there is a car at some position, maybe on position three, X zero, let's say, the starting position is three, and the speed is, say, seven. Then after every second, the position increases by this speed. We don't know the starting position or the speed. In this case, the car will be at position first 3, then 10, 17, 24, and so on. After every second, like it moves by V, so and also at second 0 this happens. After every second and at second 0, you can ask if the car is somewhere. Say, so I'm asking at 0 of position, is the car on position 6? And I get information. Here, left or right. In this case, car is left from position six. Then a second passes and you get to ask here. And you need to use thousand queries to, and there are two different versions of this problem. Either you need to find the exact values XV or something maybe slightly easier. Just at least once get the answer here. If you hit the car, you win. Can we get the direction of the car velocity? The velocity goes to the right, so up. Uh, it's, it's here, defined by this formula. After i seconds, you will be at x plus i plus i times v. If you said that uh, we will get the value of speed, I don't agree. That, that cannot happen, because with, uh, let's say, with two queries, we just get twice single bit of information, you can just distinguish between four values. And indeed, the easy version of this problem is that X and V are up to 1000, and hard is that they are up to 100,000. In both cases, it's at least one. Now that we understand the problem, time to solve it. Maybe we use binary search. What an interesting idea. At first sec uh, at second zero, we know that car is between positions zero and 1000. So time zero, car in interval from one to a thousand. So it makes sense to ask at position 500 or so then maybe we will get information that the car is uh, so ask at 500 you use let's say we get information left then at time one we know that the car the car was a sec a moment ago from one to 499 but then it moved by from one to a thousand uh, so like that sadly the range increased instead of decreasing we don't like that. If we ask in the middle, but then still we don't know anything about the speed, that's very bad. 
because the range will always get uh, greater than thousand the length will be increased by thousand so that's bad uh, still maybe we can e keep asking in the middle so ask at here what 750 or so and then maybe we'll know something eventually maybe we can say that some speeds are impossible maybe ask 100 queries like this and eventually you will figure out uh, that there can be only one possibility for how the car behaves only there will be one possibility consistent with our answers it makes some sense maybe uh, similar to previous problem because we have to uh, we have two unknowns that's not that's not as not as stupid actually it's very smart observation in some way it is similar to the previous problem in the previous problem we have agreed so maybe we should uh, assume that everything is a point we will get to that interpretation if you get you in, if you investigate this idea with binary search maybe it will indeed be quite good but i don't see a reason why it would be so maybe almost always maybe almost always there will be still some possibilities a lot of possibilities for what's the starting position and speed or maybe this leads to some proper solution interactive is equal binary search exactly but this is not a way to go in, in some other problems especially if you have a range you should ask in the middle only if the possibilities are evenly distributed we saw that in the first problem when we tried to do it optimally when we ask in the middle about the number of a's in a prefix that was fine we were able to estimate the number of queries the, the complexity of that but it wasn't optimal and the more something is not evenly distributed the worse it is to ask exactly in the middle so what about this this will be for sure a better idea ask about such position p that have the options have the uh, possible pairs xv um, become impossible if we are able to realize this idea we solve the problem uh, by this i mean that initially there are thousand squared pairs xv possible it's one of million possible pairs if we get to ask smart query that's great for us how do we do it though well we can use this interpretation still to apply the binary search from above so always when we know what's the possible range we can ask in the middle and at least we can figure out which pairs become impossible so one idea for implementation is to keep vector of pairs possible states initially you put that all the pairs of numbers from one to a thousand those are possible pairs xv and after every query you just go through all of them and you check which of them are remaining at time zero we ask five thousand i think you mean 500 to reduce the number of valid x i agree so in the actually the first query is the only one where we are in some way optimal we removed for sure have the possibilities but it isn't true anymore for the second query at least it's very hard to analyze if we ask the same position twice why is that better than asking uh, like in different positions if if you keep asking at 500 that's eventually stupid you will keep getting answers that we are to the right if we get a if you ask at some position it doesn't need to be the second zero it doesn't need to be time zero uh, if you get information left then maybe it makes sense to then ask again at the same position to see if it's still left or it's right but i don't see a reason why this would be better than asking some other value uh, all right i will tell you this with constraints given in the statement if you implement this 
everything we discussed that you you maintain this vector of pairs you maintain this range you always ask in the middle i think you will get the solution in fewer than thousand queries so you will solve this easier version of a problem but also you will not understand how you solved it or why is it good enough and there is a way to get fewer queries uh, optimal or close to optimal and in particular we need to be smarter about all of this if we want to solve the harder version of the problem with x and v up to 100,000. Ask until it crosses the position. If the speed is low, then you wasted so many queries. In particular, what about x is 1, v is 1. If you want to keep asking until the car crosses position 500, you've just wasted 500 queries. I understand that then you know exactly where the car started and what is happening, great, uh, but it doesn't seem efficient. This asking in the middle of possible range seems better. Uh, something Find something as fast as possible. You know, <laughs> Problems are about finding something fast. Counting or maximizing, minimizing, constructing. It doesn't really limit it down that much. Let's be now efficient. How do we do that? How do we split into two? Actually, it's very easy, it turns out. When you're at time, let's say, I don't know, five, you can go through all the possible states. Let's say that the possible states are 1, 1, 1, 2, something, something, uh, 3, 2, 5, 1, and a few others. For each of them, you can compute where the car would be if indeed this is, if this was the correct state. At time 5, if this is x, this is v, then this car would be at position 6. Uh, x1, v2, 11, 13. 10. Go through all the states, for each of them compute the position and ask about the median of those positions. So sort them, or you don't even need to sort. Uh, there, there is linear algorithm for median, get median. And this exactly cuts half the possibilities. Problem solved. At least the easy version. If I told, so if you knew that car can be at positions 3, 5, 10, 11, 15, 17, 17, 17, 18, 50, it isn't that smart to ask in the middle of range from 3 to 50. Even though you know, car is at least here, at most there, so the middle is 26. But if you ask about 26, you will get answer left and you only cut one possibility. That's bad. Instead, we ask about the median. In this case, I believe the median is here, 15. But let's say the median is 70. That's actually great. Either you will hit the car and you will get very few possibilities. Uh, actually, if the statement says you win immediately when you hit the car position, then you already win. Otherwise, you will get to less than half the size of this set of possibilities. So this is, it's not optimal, but it's close to optimal. It's not optimal because of ties. We don't really know how everything behaves when we get to this set. So it isn't true anymore that always we exactly cut the number of possibilities in half. It's slightly more complicated, but we are very close to optimal. Let's see the pseudocode. The vector of pairs possible states for every x for every v possible states push back uh, the pair xv while the size of this is greater than one uh, we get all the positions we so for every pair in possible states we, we know what's the current time, actually here I should say, starting from time zero, as long as 
possible states size is at least one time plus plus like that uh, positions push back the formula so the starting position plus time times the speed sort and now ask about positions half so then the medium something like that maybe minus one those are details ask about this and then uh, of course <laughs> remember the response whatever that is string whatever and now go through all the states again and remove those that do not satisfy this response now again we do this and we check if this state is consistent with the response if consistent then i don't know new states push back t. initially this new states was empty and i think it's done uh, possible states is new states easy could be slightly worse for with ties i would say it's actually better with ties we should at least it is better ties only help or at, at the end they do not help indeed mm. If, uh, if you get answer exactly here, so if you get answer yes, uh, left or right, you will get always less than half. Ties only help. If you get answer here, then everything here will never tie again. Oh, great. The time, the complexity here, the number of repetitions is log of the number of possibilities. Uh, I, <laughs> I almost wrote this. This was for the previous problem, grid. thousand times thousand I don't think there was a value for uh, what is the limit for XV uh, that many queries and the time complexity is this multiplied by well, a million uh, not really a million time complexity is just like in the previous problem it gets reduced let's let n be 1000 then this is the number of queries and now time complexity First, we need to go through that many states, because this is size of possible states. Then half of them are removed. So in the next iteration, this is the time complexity. Then that, and so on. So it's twice and then. Surprisingly, again, we got linear time complexity, even though we have logarithmically many repetitions or iterations. It's a lesson that when you think that you have n log n, and actually that's that's too much in some other problem maybe, still make sure that it's n log n, that it isn't actually reduced. Maybe that's not the good word. It isn't actually linear O of n. Now. What's left is to solve hard version, and I'm out of pages. Du, du, du. Whenever that happens, I need to copy paste some slide. When I hit new page, I would need to do something more too. Why sort? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree that median i wouldn't call it linear uh, oh yeah linear algorithm i already said like 10 minutes ago that this can be done in linear time so in this code oh you're right the time complexity right now gets multiplied by logarithm because of that uh, so actually run nth position there is linear algorithm actually it's built in uh, in c++ yeah, for nth position in general cave position you can find with this linear it's like quick sort you can google this name it there is such function in c plus then it's this step is linear instead of and login now the remaining plan 
for this problem is first to talk about visualization and second solve for xv up to 100,000 quick select is it called okay visualization is very promising and i'm sure that many strong participants would here try it not necessarily it will help but it's still educational to discuss it because in some other problem it might be useful first thing is that whenever you see something like this you should recognize a linear function i will rename the variables a little bit instead of x0 i will say b instead of this i will say a and i will move b to the end it looks like linear function f of i a and b are some coefficients of this function of course whenever we see linear functions it's reasonable to think convex whole trick but maybe first let's understand what it means for our problem because we don't minimize or maximize something convex whole trick is there to do that to minimize or maximize every possible state of a car is a linear function so if this is a or speed this this is a mm, or also let's say in brackets that's speed this is b that, that's no what am i doing oh yeah this will be the time i because this is function of i and f of i is the position at this time for example this blue line it represents a car starting at x equal to 1 and with speed v equal to 1 and in the uh, sorry it should start here at height 1 and it did after say 5 seconds it will be here on height 6 All right. Now, for every possible state, you can draw this. Actually, I should draw a bunch of functions here, but the drawing will get hard to read, so I will simplify it a little bit. Uh, I will, I will cheat a little bit, but let's say that also functions can go like this. What is a query? Uh, there, let's say that now the current time is uh, maybe, I don't know, in red. i is equal to 5. Maybe here there is 5. And you ask at position I don't know, 15. So the ask 15. You get information whether the real position is higher or lower than that. So if you get information higher, it means that it couldn't be one of those functions. If you get information lower, so maybe this, if you get information high or carries more to the right, the right means just the value is higher, so it's somewhere here. It means remove those. Or if you get information lower, remove those. That's the visual interpretation of this problem. Turns out it's not really useful. The problem boils down to the fact that in every next second you need to look at this vertical line and ask somewhere in the middle so that the number of lines above it and below it would be kind of the same. Uh, but this is exactly what we implemented here. Right? It's not useful to say linear function. No. Like, indeed, this is a linear function. This is getting value at some position of a linear function but it's not useful what we did is given i we computed positions i mean values for every linear function that still remains and we got the median out of them in this case this guy and we asked there so that we could either remove those uh, control z okay or we can remove those great not useful the second possible uh, visualization of all of this 
is somebody mentioned this at the beginning that uh, it's a bit like the previous problem because we have pairs and just like the previous problem was a grid with cells or coordinates we can do it too so what about this time mm, this crazy idea that every every state is a point this time i will put v here and uh, what, what goes there x0 initially those are possible states everything up to some n let's say n is 5 i mean the, the values are up to 5. this shouldn't be that much wider than higher so let me fix Okay, seems better now. Uh, for example, this guy, this is a state of v equal to 3, x equal to 5. This time there is no access for time. And what is that then that? What is a query now? The thing is, when you have a different interpretation and whatever was previously lines are now points then usually points are changed into lines there is something called a duality between points and lines you can swap them swap the meaning of line and point this is also true for convex holes when you want to get convex hole uh, when you get want to get convex hole of linear functions so lines you can change them to points and then just run as a black box convex hole of points and grab this and it will tell you the convex hole of lines there's this trick uh, so now query it was a point previously this time it is a function a linear function uh, and even without all this intuition you could figure out that this is a linear function because at time let's say two time equal to two when you ask about something let's say we ask about position five then if something with speed uh, something with speed one initially had position three so this guy will it would be exactly right now at this position five with speed two if something I, five is a bad example i want to go higher let's say it's time two we ask about position seven then if something uh, is has speed five uh, what am i talking about if you hit, want to hit exactly this then possibilities are with speed one you started from five with speed two you started from three with speed three you started for from one let me mark those and connect into a line this line describes a query at time two we at position seven for all the points so states below that it means they weren't fast enough so if the answer hides somewhere here the answer will be that the answer will be left for yellow part is exactly on the line and for everything here the answer will be right now the question the problem becomes you maintain a set of points at at time i you need to choose a linear function with slope minus i the slope of yellow line is exactly minus i you need to choose such a linear function with this slope that the set of points is split into two uh, si two sets of equal sizes roughly equal sizes sadly yet again this is not very useful also with higher constraints uh, because the problem boils down to the fact that when you already got um, some queries in the past you're limited by half planes so you get half plane intersection but you also need to count points belonging to uh, to half plane intersection but the vertices of that polygon are not integer coordinates so you cannot use the pick theorem 
if the past if the last two sentences didn't make any sense to you then just don't worry it's not needed to solve this problem but this interpretation is very promising and you you will try to use something called peak theorem the, the thing that describes the number of vertices uh, depending on the number of vertices and some other stuff the, the number of points inside a polygon points with integer coordinates doesn't work so visualization is not useful uh, but still in our remaining plan we have this and really to solve it like that we should just improve the code without really <laughs> visuals uh, or maybe maybe this helps maybe th this helps when you have some points the remaining points are always limited by some, ha some half planes it's not that we have an arbitrary set of points if the first query was like maybe this and you removed those points from the left then some other query was like that and we removed those points always we'll have some regular shape and from this you might get the idea that we don't need to keep all of them in space not a vector of pairs just for every x or for every v keep range of allowed speeds or for every speed you can get range of allowed x's range is continuous indeed we can get this easily without a drawing, just remember the statement. Uh, so when you keep getting answers left and right, then for every fixed, say, speed, uh, information left just limits from the right allowed the possible axis. Information right, it limits from the left. So always for fixed, let's say, v, the range for x gets updated, but it's still the range for x. If it's possible for fixed v that x is equal to 2 or x equal to 5, then also x can be 3 and 4. That's the main step. Okay, so maybe instead of vector of pairs of pairs, uh, vector of pairs, we change this to some kind of array of ranges for for every x keep range of possible speeds or the other way around doesn't really matter this resolves the issue of space complexity but not of time complexity unless we can update those ranges and yes we can if you know that for x equal to 1 the possible speeds are uh, 5 to 10 for x equal to 2 possible speeds are from 3 to 9 and so on and now I tell you at time 5, the position, I don't know, 40, the answer is left. You can look at every range and update it in constant time. Just by dividing something. I think you will divide 40 minus x, that's 39. Divide by the time and you will get what's the possible speed. At the speed. For example, you will say, oh, actually, speed here is limited by 8. Otherwise, we would get here information right. Yes, Mango, the one was sum of logarithms times k times n. Uh, so yes, we can here update ranges like this. But there is one last issue. We cannot grab all positions and choose the middle one. When we look at our, at our code, here we are actually up to there. This part was to find all possible positions right now and choose the median. And it's very hard, I don't know if it's possible, to choose the median out of those mm, quadratically many states. If x and v is up to 100,000. I would do the opposite. I don't remember which option is better. I don't know if you should for every x know the range for v or the other way around. I believe you that for speed you should know the range of x. Sure. That just maybe I will have implementation more difficult by one formula. Uh, the consistency part we can do. We just update the ranges each of in constant time. 
uh, so the complexity will be O of max x multiplied by logarithm because there is logarithm logarithmically many repetitions still. How to do this? And the keyword is randomized. We want to choose random position, but not random from minimum possible position to max possible position, which we could get the two values, but we choose random state. If you have billions of objects and you will ask about position, current position, and you will get information left or right, and you, thanks to this you want to cut away around half of the possibilities, it is good enough to just ask about the random element, position of a random element. So let's say that the possibilities now are 1, 1, 1, 2, assuming that we still keep pairs, uh, maybe 3, 2, and 4, 4, 4. Out of those, say, 4 states, we choose a random one, let's say that the current time is 5. We choose a random one, say this one, and we know, okay, then the position of this guy is 11, and we ask about position 11. Because in in, the, in this huge sequence of positions of all of those guys, we ask about random element. And this is called quicksort. When you choose a random pivot, and then you get to either, to, to one of the parts, this is exactly what, well, quick select does. Some idea that this should be used actually was that here we didn't sort to improve the time complexity by logarithm. We actually run nth position and nth position uses that thing. It uses quicksort. It uses randomization already. So if we wanted the best possible time complexity for the previous slow algorithm, we still used randomization. And it's very surprising that it is helpful actually to solve this problem for much higher constraints. We still need to be able to choose random state, uh, which is not that trivial. Uh, it's like this. If for x equal to 1, you have that v is in range, say, 2 to 5. For x equal to 2, v is in range from 1 to 3. And for x equal to 3, v is in range from 1 to 1. You shouldn't first run, generate a random x and then inside to generate a random v because then you wouldn't fairly choose a random element. So you couldn't anymore say, how is it true that on average you split the sequence into two parts? Quick select can be done linearly. I heard about it, but I don't really know how to do it. Um, we will not find the median. We will choose a random element and behaves good enough Just like in quicksort, you don't need to get median in quicksort or quick select. It's okay to choose a random pivot. Uh, okay, so the problem here is the following. You get a bunch of boxes, and there, in this case, there are four objects in the first box, three elements in second box, one element in third box. There are eight total. Four elements here, three here, one here. And now we need to choose a random element out of those eight. Then instead of choosing a random box, we should instead say that there should be probability four over eight to choose the first box, three over eight to choose the second box, and one over eight to choose the last box. So it should be weighted. Um, instead of uniformly choosing a box, it should be weighted by the size of every box. So for this, the solution is find the sum of sizes of all the intervals. This just tells you what's the number of possible states. Then use that uh, to... You have some kind of sum. Actually, it must be long, long. This is sum of sizes of intervals. And then you need to get position, let's say, i. Uh, i was already taken. k is get round from 0 to sum minus 1. This will be id, 
a random one out of uh, that many elements and you just say that those elements take the first four slots those three those one the end again i will give you a pseudocode for that uh, let's say we already did this we did this and now we iterate over the ranges like like those ranges we have this range has some size and what we do with that is if k smaller than size return guy from here else size minus equal k here we go this is how you can get a random element out of many boxes where the number of elements in boxes is not the same And now the time complexity is of the number of iterations we need, which is still this, on average, or not on average, it's around that, this magnitude. Uh, max x, let's say that n is the limit from the statement. Uh, this multiplied by n, because in each of those iterations, we go for all n possible values x or v, like this, in order to take a random element out of them. I'd find the median. Uh, use binary search? Yes, you can do that. I agree, we can find the median, but it's more annoying. Random elements is just much nicer. C++ has discrete distribution. I don't know what you pass to that function. Can you pass the whole array? Then, If so, then yeah, you can put the array of sizes to that function. It doesn't seem easier than implementing this yourself. And now we are done. That was solution to third problem. Moving car. Let's summarize the solution for moving car. Moving car. Solution summary. For every, let's say, v, maintain possible range of x, uh, consistent with the answers so far. This is an array, like this one. Uh, possible x, max v, plus one, something like this. Initially, for every v, it's just from 1 to 100,000. Then, while more than one state, possible. This thing you will figure out thanks to summing up sizes of ranges. Here you need to take random element, get random state. Oh, th this is uh, again in for loop over time. Uh, more than one state. We described in the previous slide how to do it. We get a random state. Then we ask at state first times time plus state second. Or the other way around, I think. Second was the speed. And update ranges plus x. By iterating for them, and for each of them there is a formula, using information left-right from this query, uh, you will update the possible range for every guy. This is linear, this is linear. Both are all of 100,000. This is constant. So this is linear all of 100,000. And the number of repetitions here we should expect is all of log of x times v. <sighs> Longest good segment? I think I did that two days ago in the stream. No type racer? Nah, thank you. Let's keep this to be a nice educational stream. All right. Time for any questions about solutions to the problems. As I said in the blog, I will write down some summary of the solutions and update the blog. So later when a new person reads it, they don't need to watch the full video. Also, this is the last stream of this month. 
I will now have some break from making videos, streaming. Also, at the end of the month, I'm going to Harbor Space in Barcelona to teach there for three weeks. The only improvement is use of randomized algorithm and keeping states not as just pairs. Also, previously, we had space complexity of the number of states. Now we have O of max x. I don't remember favorite problems, to be honest. I have bad memory. Thank you everybody for watching. Hope you learned something and I hope that you enjoyed this more organized format of a stream where I don't ask for suggestions as we go and instead I chose something in advance and I just go through that. Of course there is then less interaction. <laughs> well, it was an interactive... Uh, it was a stream about interactive problems but it wasn't very interactive compared to my other streams. Uh, but I still think it's more valuable to all of you. Uh, I wonder what's the difficulty of that. No. I would say with harder version it is division 1c. And not an easy problem for that slot. Still, already it's standard, it appeared somewhere. Next stream, the beginning of September. Uh, check out the Discord if you want. You can join some discussions. Thank you all for watching. Bye bye.